Hey guys, uh, here for week, uh, I believe it's week six or episode six, and uh, I'm here. I got uh, three products to review, but it actually technically comes to six movies. So I have six movies to review, a short update, I have a contest as well, and a shout out as usual, and I will draw for the old contest to see who the winner is. Uh, let's get into this one right away. Uh, the first movie I will be reviewing is from Arrow Films, Madhouse. Uh, this one was made in 1981. This actually made the Video Nasties list, so it's been on my radar forever due to that. Uh, you know, I have a weird fascination with the Video Nasty movies. Uh, I thought it was such a ridiculous, weird thing that happened. Uh, so I was always interested in these types of films. I actually had the old uh, Dark Sky MPI uh, DVD, but I never had a chance to watch it. I had heard things about it. It's by uh, Ovidio uh, Asantes. Uh, I'm sorry for the pronunciation. He was a, a guy born in Greece, or he was a Greek director who worked in, out of Italy. He uh, did stuff like Beyond the Door, The Exorcist ripoff, and Tentacles, The Jaws ripoff. Uh, Tentacles is pretty hilarious if nobody's seen it. Great music, and uh, has some heartless scenes in there, and uh, a very surprisingly bizarre cast. But yeah, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about Madhouse. Uh, Madhouse has a lot of the similar things into a slasher, you know, film of the time. It has the evil sister, evil twin sister, the escape mental patient, the evil dog, the crazy surprise birthday party thing going on. It's got all these typical things, and uh, but it manages to do some things really nice. It's shot well. Uh, the score is actually by Riz Ortolani, who did Cannibal Holocaust, House on the Edge of the Park, a slew of stuff. Uh, he's probably one of the greatest composers there is, did a lot of spaghetti westerns as well. And it, what's weird about this movie is it actually takes uh, some of the more harsher sounding uh, songs and scores from Cannibal Holocaust to pew, 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 the tribal stuff. It kind of adds this primitive layer to the movie. It's kind of strange that that's a score, you know, but Italians, uh, they used to reuse a lot of scores. Uh, see uh, Bruno Mattei reusing uh, Contamination and Dawn of the Dead's Goblin score for his movie Hell of the Living Dead. But so they have that going on. Uh, so yeah, Madhouse. Uh, like I said, it, it does, it's like it's a very competently well-made movie with a good score. Uh, it's well shot. It's really well acted, surprisingly. It has a lot of these zany, over-the-top characters that somehow make them um, sympathetic and relatable uh, just by being bizarre. <laughs> Almost like they walked off the set of The Sentinel or Rosemary's Baby. Like, hey, we're from that apartment. Our lead lives in this kind of apartment that's getting uh, rebuilt. So, you know, that leaves up for, you know, possible jump scares and shenanigans. And, uh, of course, her crazy sister who abused her as a child escapes, and uh, people start disappearing. She doesn't really notice it, uh, and it's all accumulating to their birthday party because they had this weird birthday history. But it's nice to see that her, her, her sister has this weird disfiguring disease, and she's like, we're no longer twins. Uh, and there's, there's a twist at the end, but it's fairly obvious, and they don't, they don't really even try to hide it. But uh, the thing that got me is when people die in this movie, I felt bad. You know, a lot of people like to cheer on the, the crappy teenagers. I never was that guy, really. I, I like to like characters before they get they bite it. You know, I want that emotional impact. There is sometimes a great satisfaction and a baddie getting killed, but uh, Madhouse doesn't go that way. Uh, and it's also cool that uh, the killer has an extension. Uh, she has, like, a dog that she uses. Uh, how I know, well, you with the twist, you would understand how she got the dog outside of the insane asylum once you escape. But the dog, uh, it's a Doberman Pinscher. Uh, no, it's actually a Rottweiler. Uh, it's, it's very scary, to be honest. And there's a scene with uh, one of the uh, good sisters, uh, very somebody she's very close to that has a run-in with the dog. And that scene is just uh, very depressing. So it grounds this uh, slasher movie uh, with uh, some harsh deaths. Uh, there's a decent amount of gore in here, like I said, and there's a very, very memorable scene with a power drill. Not as uh, memorable as a City of Living Dead Italian film drill with Bob and Giovanni Radici and whatnot, but it's a fairly memorable scene. Uh, on the Blu-ray, there's an interview with one of the older actresses. She's really candid and funny and talks about, you know, she's very grateful and being an older lady in Georgia, how she's getting a lot more roles now and she's kind of semi-retired. There's an interview with the director on here and there's an interview with the DP. The DP's like, this isn't really my type of film. Glad people like it. And, uh, 
he, he he's pretty candid as well. They all give good interviews. Uh, surprisingly, the director gets a less in depth than the other two, but I enjoyed the special features. Uh, there's a commentary by Hysteria Continues, which is uh, you know a podcast. I, I I'm not too familiar with them, but they did a damn good job. A guy from Ireland, England, and a couple guys from Tennessee. They know their slasher films. They talk more about uh, how this relates to a lot of the films in the genre. And you know this movie is gonna definitely be prepared uh, compared to Happy Birthday to Me. It has a surprise birthday party is made in the same year. And this guy had already had a, a you know, been considered a ripoff king. So, but uh, to be honest, I think Madhouse is damn good uh, for a slasher movie, especially in '81. Uh, good gore, good score, and uh, all around a really good cast. I would uh, say check out Madhouse from Arrow Films. Uh, well worth your time, especially if you're sick and tired of watching the the ten same slasher movies you've seen a million times. But what I will also give up for this one is uh, I also, I met, well, not give up, but I will uh, also wrote a nice uh, written review down at Screaming Toilet. So uh, check it out. Uh, it'll be the link below the same place you'll enter the contest in. So check out my written review if you'd like it. I'd really appreciate it. So check out the uh, Arrow Story video. Uh, a funeral home and of course in the in real life this house was uh, also a funeral home as well Okay, uh, the next one we have here is a Christopher Lee double feature. And this is The Blood of Fu Manchu and The Castle of Fu Manchu. Now, I've heard of the Fu Manchu movies before, but I had actually never seen them. This is both film, uh, two films on one disc. I shouldn't say both because I made that mistake. This is actually the fourth and the fifth of the series from the 60s. The first being The Mask of Fu Manchu, the second being The Brides of Fu Manchu, and I believe the third, Vengeance of Fu Manchu. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm halfway through, actually, on this movie, on The Blood of Fu Manchu. These are both directed by Jess Franco and uh, uh, produced by Harry, Harry Allen Towers, who did a bunch of British stuff. So you kind of know what you're getting into here. This is in between, you know, a lot of the Hammer Dracula films. So Chris Lee's not a huge star. He hasn't done anything like Star Wars or, you know, anything like that. He still has a name recognition, but he's not the big star yet. So I'm halfway through Blood of Fu Manchu and I realize, man, this is kind of strange. There's a lot of pre-established things going on. And I'm like, you know what? I've heard about these before. This isn't the first one. I just assumed that it was the first one like a moron. My problem. Uh, so yeah, these movies are ridiculously hokey. Uh, Christopher Lee is in, I guess, Asian face is what you call it. So, you know, that's it's not typically PC here. But what's surprising is for 68, uh, Blood of Fu Manchu uh, if, if, is pretty raunchy movie. has some nudity, has some uh, carnage in here. Now, the fight choreographing uh, in here is awful. You know, the dubbing's pretty bad for the most part. Uh, the blood doesn't look very good. There's bad dummies. So all the crazy shenanigans and torture and uh, towns being butchered can't be really taken that seriously after all. But uh, what surprised me, like I said, was uh, how raunchy it was for 1968. Uh, the plot is Lee wants to send out all these women lined with venomous poison to take out his enemies all around the world. A kiss of death, if you will. Uh, Nayland Smith, who seems to be the, you know, reoccurring hero of the series... And his uh, Dr. Petrie, who the same actor appears in all five films, uh, they have to stop him, along with this uh, uh, 
anthropologist who uh, a journal, uh, German anthropologist Carl Jensen, and uh, they basically team up. And uh, but Nayland Smith is uh, injured because of the poison, but he hasn't died, so they have to stop him. Uh, they run into this weird bandit who plays part comic relief and part horribly, horrible, disgusting, despicable villain. Uh, he's from tons of movies. He's in Coming at Yeah, He's one of the evil brothers. If you guys remember the spaghetti western, so yeah, it has some familiar faces in here, but. Uh, uh, all in all, man, this movie is, is pretty bad, pretty stupid, pretty hokey, but, uh, it never gets boring. And that's what, uh, the blood of Fu Manchu has going for it. Uh, you know, typically, uh, these movies be pretty awful if there was none of this ridiculousness and the ludicrous of this one keeps it going for a while. And, uh, it's never boring. It's not good, but it's never boring. And of course, Fu Manchu promises to be back. Uh, on this disc, uh, the, on this feature, there's a nice little featurette on this uh, movie. There's a nice little featurette on here talking about it. And uh, it has uh, Christopher Lee, uh, one of the actress who plays Lee's daughter in it, uh, the producer, uh, and Jess Franco. Uh, three of which are all dead in here. So that's kind of depressing. This was made in the early 2000s. It came from the DVD. Uh, this is actually my favorite part of the movie. They're candid. It's about 15 minutes long. They talk about it. And uh, they're not, they, they know what kind of kind of movie it is uh the second one the castle of fu manchu uh yeah uh this one's like the uh, blood of fu manchu but it doesn't have any of the raunchiness it doesn't have any of the nudity and it's it's the latter sequel it's kind of like in the hammer draculas where one hammer dracula would be like this has nudity and gore this is kind of surprising and the sequel to it uh one of the nine of those hammer dracula movies uh would be very tame. It's almost like they knew they overcrossed their boundaries and had to go back. Like they reigned uh, just Franco in. But uh, what it what it does is it makes that same hokiness, bad fighting, bad dubbing, uh, even a uh, bad uh, acting from just Franco in here. Probably because due to his bad dubbing, he also acts in it. Uh, so it makes it even more boring. Uh, now this one does have this. Uh, big scale kind of thing going on, which I appreciated. Uh, Christopher Lee this time creates this device, or I should say Fu Manchu, creates this device that uh, freezes the water and uh, he can kind of control it. So he's he's blowing up, blowing up dams, sinking ships, and uh, the miniatures on the dam and the ships uh, look great. I'm actually not 100% sure if that was stock footage for the dam or a miniature or a mixture of the two, but they did a really good job editing that scene and it makes this kind of small budget movie a little bit bigger on a bigger scale, which I kind of appreciated. But besides that, uh, Nayland Smith, of course, and Dr. Petrie are back. Uh, and this Istanbul like drug kingpin gets involved in his female tough bodyguard. But uh, besides that, there's not much going on in here. There's a pair of young lovers, not young lovers, but a doctor, a nurse lovers in here that has some sort of interest. But all in all, man, this one is pretty boring and pretty hokey. And uh, I wasn't a fan of it. And uh, the feature on here is actually really funny because the producer gets in and says, Thank you finally did it, Jess. You killed Fu Manchu. Because they obviously know that there's got to be this rugging, running gag of these, you know, cheesy, kind of crappy movies. But, uh, you know, they kept them going because they were fun and people dug them. But, you know, Jess Franco finally killed that franchise. And, uh, you know, Jess Franco is one of the most prolific guys. Uh, you've seen. 20 European movies, five of them were directed by Jess Franco. Uh, I used to kind of be like, oh, I never heard of this one. I get really excited to look at it. Jess Franco? Ah, shit. But uh, over time, you know, he had some winners like Count Dracula and uh, Bloody Moon is pretty cool. So uh, he, I came around to Jess Franco. These blood on uh, blood uh, for Fu Manchu uh, or Blood of Fu Manchu is not, is okay, but Castle of Fu Manchu is not one of his winners. But uh, the feature right on there, again, is the highlight from early 2000s. So, yeah, they look pretty good, uh, especially for the late 60s movies, and I like the presentation. So, uh, they're worth picking up if you like these especially, or if you want to check out the featurettes and maybe, you know, laugh at something pretty hokey. I actually, actually writ, wrote something down at uh, Screaming Toilet for this one, too, all at the same link below. So, uh, check that out, if you will. There's a couple trailers here for you guys to get the, the feel of these hokey nonsense. You have been chosen to take part in a great mission as the instruments of my destiny. When my father gives an order, you will obey or die. Centuries ago, an ancient race conquered this continent. Now their secrets are mine. And with this knowledge, I shall master the world. Power of ancient poison transmit to this girl so that she will destroy the enemies in our path. Strike, Nayland Smith. A most persistent man. He must be eliminated. 
heaven's sake, Petrie, go after. <laughs> the hunt for a lost civilization brings Assistant Commissioner Nayland Smith's agents into Fu Manchu's secret territory. <laughs> Nayland Smith has many spies. Lopez might be one of them. Christopher Lee. You will seek out my enemies, and you will destroy them. Sai Chin. They tell me you can dance. Tonight, you will dance for the last time. Richard Green. I can't see. I'm blind. Maria Rom, Shirley Eaton, Howard Marion Crawford. Have you ever heard of the kiss of death? No. Somehow, the poison was transmitted. And after a few days, the victim died. At first, he went blind. Within a few seconds of receiving the kiss of death, Fu Manchu is in that region of South America, protected on one side by the Andes, and on the other by the Matto Grosso. Fu Manchu is there, of that I'm certain. He found the poison. Only he may know the antidote. The blood of Fu Manchu, and the only man who can save Nayland Smith from an ancient and deadly poison is Dr. Fu Manchu, his greatest enemy. A further warning to humanity. If the governments of all the nations do not accept my terms, in four days' time, I will bring desolation to mankind. The castle of Fu Manchu. The signal isn't getting through. Strengthen the signal. Oh! Do as I say, strengthen it! In his eternal fight to dominate the world, Fu Manchu has discovered a new and horrifying weapon with which to demonstrate his power. Fu Manchu is only interested in destruction. Hmm. But what can we do to save Professor Hercules? I believe it's a question of saving the world, Dr. Kessler. Although the greatest, Nayland Smith is not the only enemy of Fu Manchu. <laughs> She fights like a man. She is Omar Pasha's favorite. We must kill her. Take her away. For the most devilish part of his plan, the many arms of Fu Manchu reach out across continents to bring unwilling assistance to the castle of Fu Manchu. Bring forth the two prisoners. Christopher Lee is the dreaded Dr. Fu Manchu. Sai Chin as his sadistic daughter, Lin Tan. Marie Percy as his most vulnerable victim. Richard Green as Nayland Smith, his arch enemy from Scotland Yard. I need Heracles to complete my plans. I need him alive, conscious, coherent. Therefore, you will operate. If I refuse, hmm? then Dr. Ingrid Koch will die an extremely painful death. Flood the tunnels! If disaster is to be avoided, I shall insist on complete cooperation. I shall give no further warning. In 14 days from now, I shall strike. The last thing I will be reviewing is actually a big box set. It is three movies uh, by Jacques Rivette. I've actually hopefully pronounced that right as a French director, and I have not been familiar with his work. So, yeah, when this came, I was like, 
cool. Let's let's dive into the year. You know, I'm a little bit out of my element. These are uh, French art films, and they're not more. They're not really modern. They don't really have a too extreme extreme side to them. So that's more my like art films that kind of go into the extreme territory or just super surreal. These are surreal, but they're not as uh, typically something I would check out. But these are three films kind of interrelated. He the director wanted to do four originally to kind of like all be interconnected, but he got to do two and kind of uh, took the ideas from those two, and he ended up making a third movie years later. Uh, but yeah, uh, Duel, I believe, is the first, or Duel. Uh... Yeah, this one is probably the best of the bunch. Uh, I think so. Uh, it, it, it's like a film noir about these two uh, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, cosmic beings that want this diamond that is on Earth, and they're kind of fighting over it because whoever gets it gets to stay on Earth. But it plays out like a film noir. All these people come in and out, and they're all looking for the same person, and everybody's intertwined. Uh, I think that... Uh, all the, the, the thing about this movie, or all his movies in general, is they all look phenomenal. They're all photographed amazingly well. Uh, everybody in it is, is fairly beautiful. And there's some cool things going on. Uh, he films death, I believe, in a very comical way. It's got to be on purpose, because if not, there's some much some pretty much uh, just as bad fight and death scenes in here as there was in the Fu Manchu movies. And uh, these, these actually, I believe are done purposely in a silly matter. Or, to him, the death scenes aren't what's important. And I want a guy who watches a lot of horror films and action films and war films and westerns, the death scenes are important in a lot of those movies. So it's kind of strange that, you know, the art is the important thing in here. But uh, I felt this one was uh, the best of the bunch. I thought the story was the most interesting. I thought it flowed better than uh, the other ones. And I actually kind of enjoyed this one. I would give this one a recommendation. Uh, and it uh, stars the guy from Spotlight on a Murderer, one of the family members. He's the main guy in this one. Uh, but there's, you know, some lapses that they don't necessarily explain, which I don't have a problem with. But they, they almost uh, happen. You find out as they are happening immediately. Uh, like, there's no hints at it. There, There's somewhat some hints at it, but uh, it all comes together decently at the end of the movie. Uh, and there's a lot of unanswered questions, but uh, less unanswered questions than the next film. The next one, I believe, is Norat or Norat. Uh, yeah, Norat. Uh, again, pronunciation skills in French. Not very good. But, uh, yeah, this one uh, I thought had a lot of promise, and this is actually the one that I thought the setup was something that I would really enjoy. Uh, it takes place uh, on this island where there's this group of pirates that are responsible for the death of uh, this man. His sister wants revenge, so she kind of infiltrates this gang with the help of one of her friends who's in the gang and uh, starts picking them off left and right. Uh, the people in here are very bizarre, very weird, and again, the leader of the pirates seems to have some sort of magical powers, or they think that she has magical powers and she's keeping him in line. Uh... Just a very, very bizarre movie running in at about 2 hours and 14 minutes. So uh, it kind of pushes its runtime for me. There's lots of air in the movie. Uh, again, it's shot wonderfully. Almost every shot is an art uh, art piece. Um, but I thought that it was a little too long. I, I felt myself kind of uh, wanting it to be over, which I shouldn't say because maybe I'm just a, a simpleton. But again, it's a lovely looking film, but two hours and 14 minutes of loveliness that doesn't go very far for me uh, after I get uh, disconnected from the movie. I think like the ending is amazing how it ends. And uh, again, I like the elements of the all-female pirate gang I think is really freaking cool. Uh, and I like some of the characters, but uh, I'm not necessarily sure if I can uh, vibe to this guy's style or understand everything. Maybe another view would help, uh, possibly. But that is a uh, Norat, uh, the second of the uh, group of films. Uh, the final one here is a uh, merry-go-round, and this one definitely starts out the most uh, straightforward. It, it stars Joe uh, Del Sandro. Uh, hope I, hopefully I pronounced his name right. He's in uh, the Andy Warhol movies, uh, Flash, Trash, Heat, uh, <laughs> Andy Warhol's Frankenstein and Dracula, or Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula, and uh, another Arrow release here, uh, The Climber. So he's in a slew of stuff, uh, a lot of movies I've actually seen him in, and uh, he basically, him and another woman uh, are called to phone in to go to France to meet with uh, the girl's sister, and it's uh, one of his former lovers, or uh, current lover. Uh, he comes from New York, she comes from Italy. So they come from far away, and immediately there's mystery. 
This one plays as this kind of strange, they, they describe it as a surreal mystery, but uh, it, it seems like everything is almost in real time here. It, it's it's fairly drug out in, in parts, but I think this one actually looks the best. It looks so crisp, it looks like it was shot yesterday. Uh, it is in a full frame, but uh, I believe that's how it was shot. Uh, everything looks so beautiful in this movie, it's hard to look away for times. And, and, and at first, the first 15 minutes, you are sucked into the movie uh, visually for sure. As it progresses, I'm sitting here trying to handle the story and everything. I, I pretty much got the gist of everything going on. More characters are coming in, kind of confusing it, uh, elaborating the story. Uh, basically, what we have here is uh, uh, the girl's father had died and uh, he left them some money. The house has been sold. And the girl uh, who called them says, you know, dad's not dead. He actually is alive. Somebody's telling me this. And this big mystery of them trying to find the father, of them trying to get the money and double-crossing and intertwine things. And, and uh, of course, it ends in tragedy. It is a French film after all. Uh, so that goes in, and it's about 2 hours and 40 minutes. And uh, a story like this would typically probably run at an 80-minute mark. So we have a lot of, you know, going off to the side, slice-of-life stuff, and uh, weird surreal moments of Joe running in the woods uh, from this other character who's only, I'm not sure what that character is supposed to resemble uh maybe guilt i'm not i'm not necessarily sure or uh so it's a very bizarre film with uh lots of weird stuff going on and i'm not necessarily sure how i felt about it in general uh again uh i'm sure there's a lot more people that could shed some more light on this stuff but if you're looking for movies that look beautiful and uh every every scene is a photograph and uh, you're less concerned about plot, you're more concerned about images or possible uh, surrealism, uh, I would say that I would check out uh, the second one more for surrealism and the first one. And this one, I would say give it a spin. Uh, it is really well shot, like I said. Uh, all three of these have subtitles when they speak in French, but sometimes they jump back to English, and there is no subtitles. There's no subtitles you can put on there. Uh, and the strange thing about Merry-Go-Round is the band is a character. Uh, they'll play the loud, kind of bassy music, and you'll see them playing for a couple minutes, and then it will cut back to the scene, almost as if the band is in the film, and uh, they're setting the whole tone of the movie when they want to, when something different is going to happen. So it, it's definitely, uh, you know... Uh, experimental film all these are kind of in that in that vein and uh they are interesting but uh a longer than i would think they should be but uh check those out if you're interested this is a nice looking set uh again it looks pretty damn good
Ladies know Lucifer fell, yet still are proud. business. Three holes. There's plenty holes all over the place. There, let's take a look upstairs. Come. Down here. Come on, Leo. Try to fix your mind on threes. is to bring me up here. Huh? What are you looking for? Who are you?
Okay, uh, the shout-out today. I've decided to give a shout-out. Not that they need my uh, help or support. Uh, I'm sure they appreciate it, even though they have su they, they, they do such a good job. I'm sure they have a lot of people supporting them. This is the Pure Cinema Podcast. Uh, it's done by Brian Sauer and Elric Kane from uh, Shockwave's podcast. Uh, these guys do a, a lot of cool stuff on their podcast. They talk about, they'll do lists of, you know, cult films. They'll say they're top five Westerns, but they won't pick the typical Westerns. They won't be like, Good to Bad and Ugly, Unforgiven, Tombstone. They'll pick... Uh, the cult films that they believe don't have enough uh, exposure on them, is, which is something I really like. Uh, it is a podcast, like I said, you can subscribe in iTunes. There'll be links below where you can click on their Facebook and they'll have links to all their stuff on there. But I really enjoy it. Uh, they cost me a lot of money. They, they talk about so much stuff on there. Uh, Elric Kane uh, has a very electric, uh, a, a different taste, and uh, he's seen so many movies. Both of these guys actually have, uh, and I really dig their podcast. Uh, it helps work go by much quicker, so uh, check that out. Not that they need uh, the shout-out, but maybe some of you guys, I think you guys will get a kick out of it, especially like cult films. Uh, they, they do all sorts of episodes and whatnot. And they actually just had an interview with uh, for a bonus episode with uh, Bill Olson from Code Red, so you know, uh, there, he doesn't do, give many interviews. I think I've only seen one before. So yeah, check their podcast out let's get into the original contest well the the old contest i'm going to draw for it and then i'll do the new contest this is actually we are the flesh from arrow films brand new sealed and everything uh let's see who wins this one we got the baggie here i'm going to do it right in front of the camera close my eyes well now i'm closing my eyes. well look away Who do we got? Chris Neal. Hey, buddy. I actually know Chris Neal. He's a cool guy. He uh, was on the set of uh, Severed Ties by uh, Adam Clevenger, and I was in that one. But, yeah, pretty damn cool, Chris. Shoot me your information on Facebook because we're friends on there, or uh, I'll shoot you an email if I don't hear from you. But you won the We Are The Flesh Blu-ray, so congrats, man. And uh, the new contest is again for an Arrow release. Uh, so, yeah, guys. It is for the new edition, Sealed of Brain Damage by Frank Heenan Lauder. I love this movie. Great movie. Uh, all you got to do to enter the contest is go to the link to Screaming Toilet where you see my written reviews of Castle and Blood of Fu Manchu and of, um, what was the other one? Madhouse by Arrow Films. Go there. Uh, go to the comments below on that link of Screaming Toilet and uh, leave a content, uh, comment that says, Hey man, enter me in the con competition. And uh, if you want to say something about the video, that would be great. Also, you have to be subscribed to my YouTube channel and like the screaming and have liked the Screaming Toilet Facebook page. Uh, so that's all you got to do for that. Again, uh, for the Brain Damage Arrow uh, release, which is a damn good release. I reviewed it a while back, so check that out. Uh, I think it's a hell of a prize. It's a nice hard case. It's a really cool movie, and it looks beautiful in HD. Now it's time to get into the update. Here we go, guys. First and foremost is... Uh, I'm super excited this came out. I haven't seen this in years. I had a bootleg of it. And uh, this is Hack a Lantern from Massacre Video. This movie is, I believe it's remastered on uh, the original Camera Negatives, which is so freaking cool. Been waiting to see this. This will definitely be getting a review next week. But yeah, I love that Massacre's doing Blu rays. I love that they're remastering these movies. But uh, if you guys haven't seen Hack a Lantern, do yourself a favor, man. It's been a long time since I've seen it. But uh, I just remember this weird, bizarre feeling to it. And the grandpa in the movie, super freaking memorable, Satanist. Uh, yeah, cool, cool stuff. Uh, guy was selling these. Online, pretty good price, man. I think I paid, what did I pay for this? Uh, 25 bucks for Cheeky, Black Angel, Private, and uh, Mona Moore uh, by Tino Brass. Uh, I've not seen any of his movies except uh, Caligula, I believe he had some part of. But yeah, nice set, good price on Blu-ray. And we also, I also got from Cult Epics, that's a Cult Epics release, uh, In a Glass Cage on Blu-ray for 12 bucks, sealed. Love this movie, but again, it's been so long since I watched it. That's the problem with watching so many movies and reviewing so many movies. You watch a movie, you love it, you don't see it for 10 years. Or you watch a movie, you don't remember it very much, and then six years later, seven years later, someone comments on your video and they ask you a question about it, and you're like, sometimes I remember everything about it. Sometimes I don't. I don't know if I'm getting senile or what's going on. But uh, my edition of The Void came in. No slipcover, unfortunately, but I'll live, you know. Uh, I have mixed feelings on that one. I do think you should see it. Amazing special effects. And I'll probably review that one at some time. I want to get in more depth about it and watch it a second time. Because I think that it's like two steps away from being one of my all-time favorites. I just, I need to reevaluate some things on it. 
Uh, Full Moon had a sale. I had to pick up Creepazoids. Years ago, I tried to watch this. Like I was like 17. Did not like it. But uh, any movie with Leanna in it can't be that bad. And it's got creatures in it. Sounds like it's right up my alley. Uh, Virtuosity on Blu-ray. It's just a cheap uh, Blu-ray edition. This is Russell Crowe and Denzel Washington. This is actually directed by a guy called Brent Leonard, who uh, did The Dead Pit and The Lawnmower Man and Feed. And he's, I believe, originally from Toledo, Ohio, which is where I'm from. So yeah, giving him some support there. Plus, I used to like that movie as a kid. And uh, at one point, me and Dustin were talking about it. We're like, remember that freaking movie? Nobody talks about that. And uh, I, well, I wanted to see it again. A Blu-ray edition of Major Dundee. I believe this is not the Twilight Time. This is not region locked. It is English friendly, and I believe it's from Italy. So if you're interested, it's a Sam Peckinpah movie. This is the extended cut. A Reason to Live, A Reason to Die from Kino. Uh, this one, I believe, actually is a is not the longer international cut, but I heard it doesn't lose anything. But you got James Colburn, Telly Savalas, Bud Spencer, and this is kind of like your, it sounds like your Dirty Dozen Man on a Mission. And I believe I rented that as a kid because Telly Savalas is on the cover. And I started watching it, and I never, I never finished it. Face to Face. Another Spaghetti Western from Kino. Barquero. Lee Van Cleef. Western. I think Warren Oates is in this one too, so that's pretty cool. Those two together. Western here. We got A Violent City. This is an Italian import. I believe it's English friendly as well. With Telly Savalas, Charles Bronson. Which is, a uh, you know, they're reunited after... I believe they were Battle of the Bulls together and, of course, the Dirty Dozen. Chino. This is a French import of a Blu-ray. I'm not 100% sure this is English friendly yet. Have not opened it. But this is a Charles Bronson Western. Now some DVDs. Massacre Time. Now I know this is kind of a bootleg here, but it's a Fulci Western. And I've never seen it. Love Fulci. And uh, Full Moon was nice enough to send this one for free on DVD. I already had it though when I ordered Lurking Fear. I have the Blu-ray of Lurking Fear. And last, but certainly not least, from Massacre Video... My Tumbling Doll Flash VHS tape came in. It's probably pretty graphic. I don't know if I should show the back. It looks pretty nasty, but there we go. But that's the last tape I needed. I think I'm all caught up. But thank you a lot, guys, for watching. And go to the Screaming Toilet Facebook page and give it a like to enter the competition. Go down to the Screaming Toilet link that uh, is posted. Read the reviews of Castle and Blood of Fu Manchu and Madhouse. And leave a comment to enter the competition to win Frank Keenan Lauder's Brain Damage. Uh, as always, uh, I'm glad you're subscribed. I appreciate it. And uh, if you ever need to talk to me, shoot me a message. And we can chat movies if I'm not busy. Uh, have a good one.